This is Remo Daily, your daily dose of inspiration. Welcome to our amazing little nook on the internet, Remo Daily, world's first virtual talk show. On our agenda today is persuasion, how to measure it, how to do it, how it works. And our guest is James Lezak. Welcome to the stage. Thanks, Felix. It's really great to be on such an amazing show and to get to see you again. It's been a while. It's been a while. We actually met when you worked at the New York Times. You were up there in the upper floors of the New York Times building. Uh, you had your corner office. You were a vice president. You were taking care of the international team. You worked on an amazing intersection of designers, journalists, technologists, marketers. And you thought hard about opening this platform to millions of people around the world. What made you leave your corner office? Well, you know, we were doing all this work on storytelling. And I asked myself, how do we know we're actually changing what anybody thinks? And some of those stories are very important. Big stories about climate change or what's going on in the world. Um, and even some of the commercial work that we were telling about our own company. Um, and I realized there wasn't a good way to answer that right now, but I happened to have that background in science and I realized that there was a measurement challenge that would be really interesting and solvable. So that really motivated me to get out there. I think anyone that's ever had something important to say has wondered, am I actually changing anybody's mind? A measurement challenge about changing everybody's mind. Can you tell us more about that? I mean, you're an experimental physics PhD, but just for people like me, you know, like, what does that mean? Like, what was the actual challenge that you identified? Well, when you're a storyteller with a really specific goal, maybe you're a campaigner on climate change, or maybe you're a brand storyteller wanting to say why people should subscribe to the New York Times, you're really trying to change how people think about something. You know, that's different from a goal that's just about getting more clicks on something or getting someone to hit the like button on, on Facebook. Um, so if that's your goal, you know, you want to do more of it. And there's different ways that you can tell a story. So let's say there were half a dozen different stories you could tell of ads or messages. Which one mm -hmm. causes more persuasion? Could we measure that? Could we say that one message causes twice the persuasion of another one? In other words, if you spend a lot of energy telling that story and promoting it, you'll move twice as many people to understand this issue or to support acting on the topic or the issue or even just buying the product. What I understand is that you're trying to measure this, but I also imagine every one of us has a different backstory, a different upbringing, a different geographies, neurodiversity. How can you turn that into a tool? On your website, it says Swable measures how effectively media content changes opinions. So you put a technology behind this that if I understand correctly, allows your clients to test messages or narratives, as you just said, even before they put them out there. So, so can you walk us through how this actually works? Like, yeah. let's say I want to tell a story about remote daily uh, and how it's changing the world of work. How would I use your platform to do that? Well, first you start with the creatives and the message strategy people. So you have some ideas, we don't generate the ideas and we don't know people's campaigns. They, they know them, but they've typically got some set of choices. So you might say, we're going to emphasize this part of the value proposition. It's mindfulness and it's, you know, the, 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 the great talent that performs them on the show, or you might emphasize the time that it's on. There's often these different parts of the story that you might wonder which parts of that story are more important. So you come with a set of options. Maybe it's call it five. There might be ads or videos, or even just a few lines of text. And the question you're trying to answer is if this is the key message that I promote, this is that one. Well, people have more demand for this show or this product than the other choice. And so really what Swables do is answering that with an experiment. And the experiment brings in thousands of real people. We don't try to guess. We do a real measure. And some of them show, I've seen, uh, I've shown one of the stories and another one's shown the other stories. And we split them into groups. So each sees only one story. And all of them are automatically surveyed with a quantitative survey at the end. They may be asked a question, how much do you love remote daily? Um, how much do you care about climate change, whatever represents the goal of that communication. And so if it works, the group that saw that message should have higher scores on that survey than a group that did not see it or that saw one of the ultimate messages. The platform just makes that really fast. 
um, really high powered. So you've got a lot of people and the math is done really carefully. Um, and to your point about the representation of different groups in the community, it pays particular attention to making sure folks are represented. Uh, that's, that's why people use it. You're, you're it, talking about fast. You're actually promising 24 hours. That's like better than your average PCR tests. That's really fast. <laughs> like, how yeah. do you, how do you do that? Like, how do you, do, how do you reach so many people in so little time and actually analyze what they respond? Yeah. Well, you know, the same kind of idea was possible before we built Swable and it would take people about six weeks typically. Um, so we really just started by asking why, why is it taking six weeks? And if you do that, there's a few big buckets of where that time goes. A lot of manual setting up and doing analysis. Well, we've got some of the world's top engineers and um, scientists, and they've engineered an automated cloud delivered version of that analysis. So it no longer needs to be a lot of hard work done repeatedly in different ways. It's done systematically the same way by the code. The other big piece of it was just how long it took to get the respondents into the surveys. Almost a hundred years ago now, really great firms like Nielsen were started and they have quite manual processes for signing people up to join their panel. You know, they'll send a dollar bill to you in the mail and, you know, say, please, could you fill out our form? It's kind of cool. One of our engineers got one in the mail. I thought it was very funny. Um, and, you know, brilliant. But obviously that takes a while and the number of people you get a day or a week or a month is limited. Um, we've taken advantage of the mobile app ecosystem, which has really matured in the last years to give us access in easy ways as a technology company to users of other people's apps. And we can effectively borrow those users at, in very large numbers, pay the publishers of the apps for that access, but also the users are given something of value as well, which is in the app, maybe an in-app currency or maybe a premium feature. So everyone wins, everyone's happy. We give them a really good experience and we can get potentially really large numbers of them much more quickly than the older methods. Wow, and you even have uh, in our community here former Nielsen uh, employees. <laughs> Shout out to you, Anne, who know exactly how long it can take to send a dollar through the mail and get a response <laughs> for this. So you clearly disrupted a market here. And you work for brands, you work for marketers, but you also work with politics. And obviously, that's we have to talk about this for a moment. I mean, with the midterms, there were a few people who said, well, these 10 or whatever, $15 billion, I don't know the exact number that were spent. It's just necessary. It keeps local and regional media alive. Like it, it, like entire ad agency, entire ecosystems rely on that. Other people said, this is ridiculous. Like we just spent $16 billion and everything is the same as before. What, what is your take on the persuasion budget that was just spent in the midterms? Like how do you look at it as a tech entrepreneur? Oh, look, that's a great question. I mean, as a citizen, I do think some real questions to ask about how much of our politics should be ad campaigns versus doing other things like setting up community halls and chatting with people or doing on the ground organizing. And, you know, I guess as, as Sway, what we've done is really recognize what you just said, which is that actually right now, the vast majority of energy and dollars goes to advertising for these election campaigns. And when they're very important and a lot's at stake, you, you know, that work succeeding is really critical. So we sort of stay within the confines of what's being done and we say, how can you make it as effective as possible? But I do the broader question, of what are we doing and should it all just be effectively a marketing campaign is probably a very good one to ask. I mean, you, uh, if I understand correctly, you have uh, clients in politics that are on the Democratic side. Uh, John Fetterman, is that is that accurate that you work yeah, with this Yeah, I'm really excited that uh, Senator-elect Fetterman uh, got up against the odds. Yeah, that was a really great moment for them, obviously, and I think the country, but also us. Too. Against the odds. Uh, do you just, when you work with uh, Mr. Fetterman and his, and his team, do you do you just measure like what what do you do for him let's let's ask this way because I, I i i'm trying to understand how that actually worked yeah well we have a really narrowly defined lane as a technology platform builder and operator and so we really deliberately stay out of the game of telling people what to say i think part of what i observed going into the space was that there was a, a mixing people with the data and the people telling political leaders what their strategy should be or even what their policies should be and I, I felt that 
there needs to be a, a separation of concerns there. You, you know, the, 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 there are a whole bunch of considerations that go into how to run a camp, including what's important in the world and how can I make the world better? <laughs> and not all of them can be addressed with data. And certainly if you're a data vendor, you know, you're not the manager of the broader set of stakeholder groups in society, groups that are disadvantaged, people with legitimate claims that they want the government to address. So what we try to do is to say, hey, your job as a candidate is to manage the stakeholders and to develop the policy to the extent that part of your job is to learn how to communicate that as effectively as possible. We will do the best possible experiments to tell you which of your ways of communicating are working. So in practice, what that means is all of these campaigns have multiple ads that they've created or multiple messages that they're looking to understand the effect of. They upload them into the platform uh, and the tests are run automatically with very carefully done statistics. So at the end, they can say, hey, you know what? This one is a lot better than that one. And they can break it down by groups. They can say, well, this works really well with liberal or progressive folks or moderates or people in the suburbs or people who are of this age group. And they can start to understand how to be as effective as possible in communicating their story to their constituents. So it's fair to say that this historical win, you are one of the strings behind it. Um, <laughs> it's fair for you to say that, Felix. I'll try to maintain now. Most of the We're really happy we, they won. One of the messages I, I believe on your website is, um, if you care about truth, you are a scientist. I, I, I looked at this phrase for a couple of, uh, you know, I just try to uh, pro process this. Could you help me process yeah. things? Like, what do you mean by that? Well, we were inspired a lot by what Nike says it sells shoes, totally different industry, but they have a great internal tagline. They say, uh, you know, Nike's for athletes. And they say, if you've got a body, you're an athlete. And it's an inclusive vision of what they're doing that we wanted to capture. For us, you know, look, Valerie and I, the co-founders of physics PhDs, and, you know, we spent a lot of time doing science as professionals and as original researchers. What we wanted to avoid was creating any thoughts in the team that credentialized that kind of experience that made it kind of an elite and inaccessible way to the world. And instead, we think science is something anybody does that cares about truth because it's a way of thinking about evidence and a way of thinking about discovery. And you don't need to have a piece of paper from the universe to think that way. You just have to share the ethos. And how do you go about misinformation? Because obviously uh, there's this, you know, this, 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 uh, n there's also a narrative about misinformation that is really strong. Is there anything that your company does to sort of even battle that? Yeah, we're right in the middle of a bunch of research. I mean, it's, it's a sort of like a whack-a-mole problem, right? Because it's just, uh, there's an infinite number of lies you can make up for every one thing that's true, right? Um, and if some people's, political strategy is to lie, um, you know, they've got an easier job than the more complicated, nuanced truth. So, um, yeah, we work with a lot of people that are trying to understand particular misinformation, misinformation around elections, denialism around, you know, the outcome of elections and how the system works and how it should work. Um, that's a hot topic right now. We try to work pretty closely with academics who are studying that stuff. Cause I think a lot of the questions are quite fundamental. But we also try not only to work with academics because there are people out in the field actually knocking on the doors, telling the stories, you know, the practitioners, as the academics would call them, or just the campaigners as they would think of themselves. And those people need to succeed. So getting that balance right is important. But yeah, and election denialism and, and COVID denialism were pretty hot topics for the team. Uh, me coming from Europe, I'm still often, you know, dazzled by... Uh how much money is playing into narratives here and into persuasion. You are also from a different part of the world uh, growing up in, in Australia. How do you look at this now after having spent significant years here in the U.S., going to university, to school, um, and then becoming a professional? Like, how do you think money is playing a factor? And what do you do and when it comes to Swayables approach? Because obviously it still seems such an easy equation, more money, more persuasion. Yeah, we think a lot about that. And I agree, it's definitely something, you know, keeps us awake. We want to build a platform and a team and we want to do work that um, doesn't exacerbate inequalities, including inequalities between different movements that may have the backing of 
you know, piles of dollars versus those that are trying to help people that may not have those dollars. We do believe that what we're doing actually is number one, a way to have more impact with less money. You know, the real dollars get spent on TV ad buyers and expensive stuff. This is typically a fraction of that level of spend. And so partly it makes a smaller number of dollars go a lot further. I think that's one important truth about what we're doing. But more broadly, I think certain kinds of campaigns have more compelling stories to tell and actually trying to make headway on an issue versus there's another form of politics that really doesn't have as much ambition, is sort of more willing to take the status quo and find a way to sort of market a, a, a potential leader without challenging the status quo. And I think part of what we find exciting about working on persuasion is I think it enables a form of politics that is more ambitious. You know, you look at the civil rights movement, you look at the opinion polling of leaders like Martin Luther King, they were detested by majorities of the population in their time. We all pretend that we all would have been in the minority that supported them actively when they were doing their work, but that's not likely most people around us would have been just looking at the numbers. So how could you help a campaign like that to move those numbers more quickly, to win over the broader coalition they need to ultimately in the civil rights movement did win it, did it not by just saying, well, <laughs> equality only polls at 60% or sorry, only polls at 30%. Let's, let's give it up. You know, that's not what the LGBT rights activists said back at the beginning of the two thousands, when nobody in power supported them and majorities of Americans opposed them. They said, we're going to persuade you, tell our story more and more effectively, win more people over because we believe those values represent the values of this open society better than the status quo. And we want to work with folks like that that are doing important campaigns and, and help them with. And Robin is just bringing this issue into a different direction, saying in the chat that um, my daughter is a lawyer at ACLU and she's getting killed in every campaign they run on issues like gender and abortion. How can you help? Well, in fact, we were working with that organization. I mean, we were helping them. Um, and, uh, you know, look, some campaigns are hard and they're hard for a long time. So, you know, I don't want to pretend that it makes the job easy but what makes it especially hard is you do a bunch of work and you have no idea if it's just anybody and we wanted to kind of walk into that environment and say look this hard job here's some evidence to support your work you know some things are working better than other things and working better with certain groups um and we were really proud to have got to support the aclu in doing work like that i uh, you know i won't divulge the <laughs> You know, whatever the details are that I haven't got the direct commission to do, but um, yeah, we were proud to see them succeed at, you know, some campaigns we were in, involved with. Yeah. By the way, I mean, including they were right on the forefront of the LGBT rights and marriage equality movement and my um, agency that was part of studying uh, purpose also supported them on, on that too. So, you know, it's important to take the wins and remember that you know, the arc of history, hopefully bends in the direction we all expect it to. And uh, you obviously do not only work in the political field. Uh, actually, the, the most recent press that we also put in the chat here is for work that you did with a company that sells condiments like truffle oil and hot sauce. How does that go together with a Biden-Harris campaign? Well, how do you differentiate between uh, helping a condiment to fly off the shelf and a political candidate to get elected? Yeah, we had a choice early on. What storytellers would we work with? Did we want to work only with folks telling what we would call public interest advocacy stories? Um, or did we think that the technology uh, we wanted to build would also serve marketers selling products? Um, now, look, all of us, you know, are probably more passionate about changing the world that has to do with, you know, redressing injustice and making sure there's a livable planet. You know, no one pretends that we're as motivated by, you know, selling potato chips as those outcomes. At the same time, the storytellers working on commerce, you know, baking muffins, making hot sauce, you know, that's an honest day's living and we enjoy those products and they do contribute something to society. So we didn't see any reason not to support that work. And by working really closely with some of the world's top marketers, we have a much better service. You know, the technology is stress tested and deployed over a far wider set of people. So that all flows back to having a far better service for everybody, including the Federmans and President Bidens of the of the world. So we really feel good about that choice and we really value and get a lot out of the hot sauce and muffins and, you know, online retail and CPG work that 
we do. We mm-hmm. take that really seriously. We have great partnerships there and learn a lot. And I think the knowledge flows to all the communities. Doing That's it. so interesting. And, and John says in the chat, political candidates are actually like condiments. <laughs> well, uh, good point, John. What can a political candidate learn from a condiment? Like, wh- what is an example where you say, well, look at the brands, because they're obviously, you know, some of them are really doing it right. What can the people who want to change the world learn from the potato chips? That's a great question, Felix. I think that's a bunch of stuff. And the more they learn it, honestly, I think the campaigns will segmentation is one. How do you break down the audiences and who do you focus on and how do you define them? That is done much more sophisticatedly by the marketing world than the political world, who has some extraordinarily rudimentary ways at times of thinking about who they're speaking to. And I think the more they learn from professional marketers and the more quickly, um, the better. And that's underway. Folks in that world know that and they're working on it. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, I, I was going to say in addition to that, um, the, 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 the notion of branding a movement is something that also tends to get lost in politics, but is not lost on commercial brands. You know, local election races are often fought because of what people think about the brands of the political parties nationally. But you look at where the effort and money goes, and it's all telling the story of the person on the ground in that district. And far less of the effort goes to telling the narrative of what's going on in a country that this local representative is part of. And I think that's a dramatic misallocation of, of energies, which a, a commercial marketer would not make that mistake. You know, they don't, they don't sell the potato chips by sort of talking about potato chips in New York district, you know, 17 versus... New York District 18, probably 80% of the spend is a, is a clear narrative at the national level that then has its local versions that it builds off. As somebody who is not eligible to vote in this country, I may ask this question. Um, is it actually much easier for Republicans to segment because their, their party and their followers are much more homogenous than the Democrats that have maybe a more diverse audience and hence need many, many, many more little segments and target groups? I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, in all cases, there's a question of how much you don't want to overly break up the coalition either. I think a lot of what our work has been fighting recently is that, that, that often a broader range of people than you might think are open to a certain story, you know, that, that we don't need a separate message for people focused on every different aspect of their identity. We want them to feel part of a broader movement, which embraces their identity, but isn't sort of Cambridge Analytica style targeted at their exact personality profile. And, you know, um, you know, micro targeting, I think has gone too far is another way to put it. There's a pendulum swinging back towards how do we tell a coherent, authentic narrative that puts a kind of a circle around a group of people and brings them in and says, we're fighting for something. We're fighting something different from these people over here. We're coming together, embracing our differences, and and here's what it is. You know, we want to want to solve climate change. We want to build a more just and equal society. We want to help you know the groups among us that that need the help, and we want to oppose being divided on the basis of uh, identity and, and 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 money. So that you know, there's an increasing trend in that direction, which still you need good segmentation for it, but it's less it's less susceptible to the problem of the smaller pieces making the bigger hole. Obviously, uh, it has become very difficult in many parts of our society to bring people together uh, that have different viewpoints. Your own former organization, New York Times, is hosting panels of people that disagree. They're hosting a podcast called The Argument where they have a contrasting views. There's now television shows that try to do that. But do you have a recommendation maybe from your own life? Like when you go home after work, and you encounter a situation where you want to be inclusive and persuasive and bring people together, is there anything from your work that you can apply to our private lives that we can learn from you? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, I see people that are great at this. I, I don't know that I myself, one of those people, you know, I, I feel like I get quite passionate about an issue and sometimes gets right stuck into it. That doesn't always get you anywhere. Um, but I think, you know, emphasizing commonality and also not going immediately to the source of difference is important. I think, um, you know, people come together, eat meals, break bread, you know, attend community events of one kind or another. And, you know, that provides a kind of basis for them to then see each other's humanity and good intentions. And then you step into a more contentious discussion that 
can be easier to remember and to stay mindful of. Um, I don't at all want to pretend I'm an expert at it personally, but I do also want to say, I think sometimes that can be overemphasized. I mean, certainly I know the New York Times makes a real effort to kind of bring people together from all sides of the spectrum. But I think there is a healthy point at which you say some people are trying to do something different. And there's a certain point at which you need to sort of say, you know, I'm not going to try too hard to include every goal and every viewpoint in this community. You know, I think we're seeing that happen now, right now with the sort of splits going on in Twitter. You know, some, sometimes you do get in a group of people that are trying to push in one direction and you say, we're going to define who we are and we're going to define the people that we're kind of working productively with over here. And there is a contrast with some other folks. And actually, that's okay. What we hope is that people in the middle or people who are on the edges of those groups might over time join us and see that our vision of society is more compelling to them rather than sort of tying ourselves in knots, trying to figure out how we get the sort of last red hat wearing guy in a diner to join our dinner party. I think one one point you made earlier in the discussion was really key uh, to this to this problem, trust. So it is that is probably also something that all of us could take into their daily lives. Whenever you are in a contentious situation, especially when it comes to narratives, you can probably always hark back to, well, who do you trust? Like, who do you listen to on a on a daily basis, or or what do you what do you consume? Is that is that how you approach yeah. it? Yeah. Well? well, I think that's right, and I think look, folks doing some of the disinformation, you know, we've really been the first to notice that. And I think that's why they've gone straight for the trusted sources like the media, like reporters and have really run campaigns to diminish trust, like elections. We're, we're now in a situation where a significant fraction of the American public won't trust anything from a repl- reputable source. And look, do those reputable sources make mistakes? Absolutely. Should we highlight and hold them accountable, accountable for it? Yes. You know, doctors, the medical profession, profession, the New York Times, election officials, all of these people are, have a fallible, you know, um, but they've gone way too far in picture they've painted of these groups relative basically well-meaning folks kind of effectively part of some conspiracy to stop the you know movement of MAGA types from having their rightful place in society and I, I think that um that fight over who to trust and how do you hold folks accountable without going so far as to kind of removing the structure of a society that includes trusted authoritative sources I think that's a really yeah, that's the billion person question. Do you think that a, an organization like a, a news outlet like the New York Times or a brand can actually become too big and too powerful and lose trust because everybody is just looking at it like you're way too powerful? I agree totally because look with, uh, you know, great power comes great responsibility. But if there's no one checking that power, um, you've got less checks so you do do things that are less trustworthy you make a mistake and there's no incentive to help or correct it because what's where else are you going to go and i think that is a big problem you know we've got a highly monopolized media economy and a highly monopolized economy overall and as a result the checks of competitive pressure to prove trust and to continue to improve trust have really been eroded and that structural explanation is probably why you know look you go to the united kingdom and you've got you know multiple dailies you, new york in the 70s had multiple dailies now we've only got you know really one general interest daily and the one for financial people and uh you can do the best job in the world there but you just don't face the pressures that you would have if the guy next door was going to try to scoop you and you know tell the story better than than you would yeah and if any of us is planning on something like this and saying, hey, I, I am working on those checks and balances. I'm trying to set up my own small thing. I'm trying to start a nonprofit, a media outlet. Um, I'm trying to work with something like the SLU and, and run these campaigns. I'm trying to get engaged in local politics. How can they, as a small player, work with you, uh, a big technology platform with now um, coming up to 40 people working full time on this every day? Uh, you're growing and growing, you're taking on more funding. How can they be a part of what you're doing and basically use your tools in, you know, their own small ways? Well, look, that's, um, that's a great question. We try to make it as accessible as, as possible, but you know, there's certainly, you know, costs involved in running the experiments and, and doing it. So I think, you know, most of the organizations we work with are ones looking at how to optimize spend of, you know, in dollar terms, sort of 
upwards of fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. You know, otherwise it's difficult to justify the, the work being done. But those organizations are often very happy to share results, and we like you know, being kind of a broker to just help people, you know, with no cost, sort of um, learn, especially about important results, things like public health emergencies or climate change. You know, we we don't want to sort of make a buck on that. We want to figure out what the right thing to do is and get the results into people's hands um, as efficiently as possible. Um, also, people doing research in an academic context. You know, we have a lot of partnerships with top researchers around the world, and those are not really sort of commercial in their intent. They're really about learning things, um, and that helps the community. And it also helps us get better at doing experiments. So I think there's a couple of um, couple of ways. I mean, the other way would be um, come and work with us. <laughs> Check out the jobs page. Check out the jobs page. And uh, James, I can't let you go without a very, very important final question that Rashad kindly just brought up. Are you still Australian enough to actually follow cricket and okay. uh, the upcoming World Cup? You're going to get me cancelled from Australia, I, I feel. So I'm going to have to plead the Fifth Amendment, which is a right that I, I have here in the United States about my views on the game of cricket, uh, which I've never been the biggest fan of, regardless of what comes <laughs> <laughs> what. It goes for days. These guys are just sitting there drinking. I don't know. Sorry, everyone in Australia. Please let me back in. <laughs> it goes on for days and everybody's just sitting and drinking. Um, wow. Uh, I, I would say mic drop on that one. And uh, James, we're so happy to have you today and getting a little bit of a sway from your work and just a little insight into persuasion. And um, I hope you come back and share more with us of your amazing work. Uh, what you're working on, to me as a journalist, sounds like a lot of the future of where our profession should be looking into. And um, a lot of the technology that you're building right now, um, I think will be the future of how we engage uh, with media, with brands, and also with politics. So thank you so much for giving us a little window into the future. And who, to everyone who is um, not watching cricket right now and falling asleep and can actually switch on their cameras, I invite you all to uh, stretch out your hands and give our amazing guests a little Australian drizzle uh, from all around the world. Uh, thank you so much, James. Thanks for this fantastic and you, Many of you chiming in here. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, last question, James, how can we support you? What can we do for you as a community? Oh, look, um, you know, come and sign up for our newsletter and, and join us. We like to host events and webinars and we'll always send out interesting results and um, studies and findings. And please join the community. We really like to think of ourselves as curating community folks interested in these topics and we'd really welcome everybody joining. Thank you, James. Bye. Thank you so much, Felix. Hi, everybody. This is remote day.